morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Chapaw Valley Bible Church. A uh, beautiful day. It is fall. Now, what's happening next weekend that I rem I'm remembering to remind you? Daylight savings time. Yes. So next Saturday night on Halloween, turn your clocks back or just be really early to church. Whichever works for you. So I'll send out a reminder midweek. Uh, we do have the some more shoe boxes. There's some put together, and there's some that are flattened down there. They have all the information inside. It might be good to check online as well. Just a reminder that you know requirements have changed throughout the years. We used to put toothpaste in. Now we can't. We used to put hard candies in. Now we can't. So it's just good maybe to check that before you finalize uh, your shoe box. They are due back the week of November 15th through the 22nd. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and also not this coming week, but next Monday is our, or Thursday, sorry, Thursday is our monthly prayer. So that's November 5th. Um, I'm going to read Psalm 8 this morning as the call to worship, Psalm 8. Majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies, to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man, that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for psalms like these that remind us of your majesty, Father. You are great in all things, and you also sit behind, sit next to us, and you hold our hands, and you love us, and you give us your peace. And Father, for that we are so very grateful. Lord, we lift up this service to you. Father, help our minds and our hearts and our souls be quieted before you so that we may hear your worship, Lord, in our hearts, that we may hear what you have to say to us through your word, Lord. We know that you have a message for each one of us. May we hear that, and may the service give you the glory. We pray these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Oh, uh -huh. 
The scripture this morning is from Acts 17, verse 16. 17th chapter of Acts, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas in our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Father God, we just, uh, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for the gift of this day, Lord. Thank you that uh, we are here together, uh, Lord, under the uh, the Lordship of Jesus. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit uh, just fills us uh, during this time together today, Lord. We want our worship to be uh, sincere and, and, and meaningful. We want to glorify you, uh, Lord. We want this time to be a, a, an hour of spiritual re-energizing uh, as we prepare to, uh, to to hit the streets this week, uh, whether through Zoom or actually uh, on the streets, uh, Lord. But we want to be energized, filled with your spirit, thinking about you, uh, living out a, a positive witness that others may see. And then we want to have opportunities to speak the name of Jesus to others. Lord, would you just uh, open our hearts and our minds as we dive into your, uh, your word and this message this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. And, okay. You guys have a um, you know a handout? If you don't have a handout, wave your hand and uh, somebody will get you one. Um, so we've been talking discipleship. One of the aspects of uh, discipleship uh, that's kind of a, the, one of the key components of discipleship is speaking to others about Jesus. And one of the ways that we do that, we just preach the gospel message, but we also have to answer questions uh, about our faith. And so uh, one of the ways that that's handled is in this realm of apologetics, which is a defense of the faith. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how do we go about explaining God? If someone says, well, the Bible is nice, how do you know it's true? How do you know it's God anyway? Uh, you know, can I be good without God? How could God exist uh, if all this evil is going on? Um, people have a lot of questions. We have to be ready to at least give some kind of basic 
response to some of these things. It doesn't mean we have to go get a doctorate uh, you know, in philosophy or apologetics and suddenly be able to speak reams of complicated information, but there are basic pieces that we can all know and you know, I don't, I, it doesn't matter where you're at in life, how old you are, how young you are, what you're doing for work, how busy you are, how much time you have. God's gonna give you opportunities to use what you've trained for to advance the kingdom. He's not gonna waste your hard work, your willingness to be close to him and learn things about him and be ready to fight for him. He's not gonna throw that away. You know, I would argue that the more equipped you get, probably, <laughs> this might scare you, the harder work you're going to have. But you're going to get great opportunities. God, God knew before he created anything how hard you were going to work at these things. Things are already lined up down the pipeline and waiting for you, you know. So it's, it's one of those, well, why do I bother? No, the Lord's got it in place. Get going. All right, so I want you guys to really be encouraged today. Don't think that these things are beyond you. Um, I gave you a definition list this morning. Uh, this is kind of just the beginning. I'm going to throw some words around that maybe you're not familiar with. Don't be intimidated by that. We're going to touch on them repeatedly. I'll send them back to you in email, and we'll talk about them a little bit more. I'm going to give you every bit of support I can to make you as comfortable as you can be if this is an unfamiliar realm for you. So that was my encouragement. I was going to do apologetics a little bit later, uh, but then I had a really weird uh, thing happen this past week and a half where my sister, who I never hear, her, hear from, reached out to me, and she's got a friend doing a college project, and he needs to talk to somebody who is uh, different in their views of, of life than he is. He's got some kind of project he has to write. He's got to talk to four people and interview them about their worldview, basically, their politics, whether they believe in God. And he introduces, so I met this young man, I told my, I'm like, I'm telling my sister I live for this stuff, yes! You know, Rick sent him to me, you know? So I ended up Zooming uh, with this young man named Reese, and what was supposed to be a 30 minute uh, conversation went to about an hour and 15 minutes, and as you all got to know me, that probably doesn't surprise anyone here. But we had a wonderful conversation, it was in the form of an interview, so he was asking questions, and I was doing a lot of the talking, and that was the intent. So for once, I had a reasonable excuse to just sort of talk at length and not have to stop. But it was great, and he said something to me at the end, and we're going to talk more about this conversation in the coming weeks because there's just so much there to unpack. But he said to me at the end of our time talking together that he was so Grateful, and I said, "Well, why are you grateful? This is for your project, you know." And well, well th thank not only that you are giving you, me what I need for my project, but I've never had anyone explain the things to me that you just said the way that you just said them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, "Yeah, all right," <laughs> you know. So, but that jarred me. Why? Why has no one spoken to him? And what did I do? I gave him courtesy. If I started to make a real serious statement that I knew was going to just be in direct conflict with his position, I said, you know what, I'll try to say this as gently as I can. I did. I gave every courtesy in the conversation, but I still spoke the truth. Why is nobody else doing that? A, people aren't doing it at all, so that's why he's not hearing from anybody. But then the people that are are just so abrasive and confrontational and you know, we go back to Jesus and the conversation that he had and we talked about it. What do you do? He's asking questions. He's engaging. He's, he, he, you know, he's looking for points of, of, of uh, you know, relevance and, and common denominators. And we got to do more of that. So that kind of spurred me. And then the, the documentary on the Pope came out. And I really, I'm not the evangelical that runs around with a bat trying to like hit Catholicism over the head. I, I maintain that most Catholic attenders believe that Jesus is, is, is their savior, and I'm pretty confident I know where they're gonna end up, and I'll see them later. You know, the Vatican, maybe they have some stuff to answer for. Um, but the Pope is on record saying that God made gay people, and that they should not be denied a family, and that they should at least have civil unions. I, I'm not gonna unpack everything that he just said right now, but I, I just was taken aback. I'm like, what hope do we have if the Pope doesn't get these things right? You know? So 
These things are going around in our culture. We have to prepare answers both on high and, and down low and in the middle. we got to be ready to meet whoever and, and, and speak some truth because there's a lot of untruth going on. This election, this election is filled with lies, okay? Whether you like Trump, hate Trump, love Biden, hate Biden, love your country, hate your country, think the politicians are for you, think they're against you, that really doesn't matter. There's just so much junk in all of this stuff going on politically. I can't, I can't say 100% good stuff about any of them. Okay, so I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings, and I'm being very careful not to take a political position from the pulpit, because I will never do that. But, oh my goodness, we need some truth people. Mm -hmm. So God's people need to get this book out, do what we've been talking about, take discipleship seriously, read your Bible daily, pray often, and then get out there in some way or another and look, ask God to give you opportunities. you got to break routine. It's like the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If you don't ever change anything about what you're doing, how do you expect God to do things differently with you? If you want those opportunities, you got to look at your routine. What are you doing? What can you change? Small changes, big changes. So... Be thinking about these things. Be praying about these things because the lost need saving, dear ones. And there's lots of them around us. It should break all of our hearts that the people God desires that all would be saved. He loves humanity. Jesus died so that God could be reconciled with his creation. It should break our hearts that there are people out there that do not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior and will not be with him in eternity because that breaks God's heart. We have to want what God wants. All right, and as we do this now, one of the ways we're going to do this in 2020 is this apologetics. They say that, it, that apologetics is the new evangelism. I say it's kind of a blending of all of these things, evangelism and apologetics working hand in hand. Apologetics, Christian apologetics based on this. So don't let the word fool you. It still comes from this book, but it brings in philosophy and it brings in science. You don't have to be a chemistry teacher like Miss Cynthia, uh, but you can pick up some details. All right, we don't have to have degrees here. First Peter 3.15, this is one to keep in your pocket for this. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you. You have to be able to say more than I love Jesus and, and I believe the Bible. You've got to be able to say more than that today. There's too many deep questions out there just to kind of chalk it all up to mystery and then leave it for somebody else to do. Okay, we're, we're all capable. All right, I'm going to speak in some tough language now about atheism. I believe that everyone here is Christian, or at the very least, you're not a, 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 a devout atheist. So I'm going to speak in some tough language about some atheist views today as we talk about the meaning of life. Um, I wouldn't present this this way in a conversation with an atheist where I'm trying to get to know that person and, and hear their perspective more. But this is, this is a sermon, and, and it's not a conversation. Um, if we were a seeker church and we had more people looking for Jesus here, I wouldn't preach this exactly the same way. So I'm counting on my audience a little bit, okay? Um, let's have a word. Let, let, I want to pray one more time really briefly and dive in. Lord, we're about to just tackle atheism. We're, we're talking about people who have sided against you and what, what that means to them. So Lord, I just ask that through this study, through this time that we dive into apologetics, Lord, that we try to equip ourselves better, would you help us Give us opportunities to meet people who hold to this view. And Lord, help us to be so effective through the power of your spirit, your spirit and our willingness to learn that we can reach some of them, that they may give up their false view and come to know the Lord Jesus in his name. Amen. Amen. So people have always been asking big questions throughout history. If you read history, man, mankind, philosophy has been around for a long time. So they call it the first uh, of the sciences. Uh, without philosophy, you, you wouldn't have medical science. Um, you know, it's a question thing, right? Asking big questions about life. Uh, what are some of them? Is there meaning to be found anywhere? Like, what's the point? 
Okay, it's a serious question. Is there meaning? Do humans, you know, we're different than the rest of the creatures on this earth. Do we have any special value? Does it matter that we're human? Does that set us apart in some way? Are we just more advanced? What purpose do our lives serve? Besides the basic need to have food and just make some kind of money so I don't die, do I have any point, do I have any purpose to what I do day in and out? Now here's the rub, and this is where we're going to get to your definition sheet really quick. The answers need to those questions, those answers need to be objectively true for them to have any real bearing on reality. Okay, so what does objectively true mean? Objective, an objective truth is something that is true despite anyone's opinion of it. And in the realm of, of religion refers to something transcendent above humanity is where we look to to find that truth, okay? If something is subjective, it's just one person's opinion, okay? So objective, it's true despite anyone's opinion. Subjective, it is someone's opinion, okay? Think of ice cream. If I say that, that real ice cream, not the stuff made from coconut this and whatever that, but real ice cream is made from milk, all right, and sugar, all good stuff that's really bad for you. <laughs> Milk and sugar, I'm saying an objective piece of truth. Those things are true. If you go look, ask the chemistry teacher, you're on the spot today, right? You're sitting right there in front of me, you asked for it. Uh, you know, th these things are true. Science will, it's not my opinion, it's real. But now if I say to you, vanilla is the best ice cream flavor Take no prisoners, that's it. I've just given my opinion. That's not objectively true. Somebody here likes chocolate. Somebody probably likes some other ice cream flavor that I would never touch you with a 10-foot pole, but I still love you. But those are our opinions, okay? So objective, outside of opinion, true regardless. Subjective, just your opinion, okay? So with that said, atheism is on the rise in the United States. People that check themselves off as nuns, and then as atheists, when asked what they view, whether religion is a thing for them or not, more and more people believe that God does not exist and the natural world is all that there is. And since it's a growing group and it stands in direct opposition to Christianity, all right, we're going to look this morning at how atheism responds to the big questions of life. Okay? So what's going on? What, what is an atheist really have to deal with as part of their worldview. All right, and then we're going to look at our view. <clears throat> and we're going, to, we're going to contrast those things. Okay, why consider both sides like this? This is like the top level stuff right here. In order to have a conversation with an atheist and to, to want them to be saved like God does, you have to understand what's at stake. You have to understand the uh, the, the result of what they believe in, what it's all about. And they're often not very honest about these things, which is part of the issue, okay? But also, this is going to strengthen our belief. When you look at the other side and why it doesn't hold up, and then you look at your side and see that it does, that helps you kind of walk with a little bit more of a spring in your step for Jesus, okay? Because our walk of faith, right? Lots of ups and downs, hills and valleys over the years. These are things to get us out of the valley and back up onto the hill, all right? So apologist William Lane Craig, my apologist hero, you'll probably hear me say his name many times over the years, not as much as Jesus, mind you. He contends that the atheist view of life is absurd. His wording. Say he that argues again. that atheism, yep. What did he say that your last sentence again? What I just said? Yeah. Uh, William, Clay, uh, William Lane Craig, uh, he asserts that the atheist view of life is absurd. That it is absurd. He argues that atheism cannot satisfactorily provide meaning, value, or purpose in regards to life. So we're going to take a look at these things really quick and see, uh, is what he's saying, does it make sense for us? All right, so objective meaning. Now we're talking again about things that are true regardless what anybody thinks about them. Because otherwise they don't matter, they're just opinions. So, is there objective meaning in atheism? Can an atheist find meaning in their life? See, because if atheism is true, consider this. The natural 
material universe is all that exists. Okay, there is no supernatural realm here. So if that is true, then all life ends with absolute finality at the grave. That's it, you've clocked out, game over. Okay, not only that, all of this living and dying has no director and therefore no direction. Okay, according to the natural view, the naturalism view, we randomly crawled out of the primordial soup and through the process of evolution, we have developed into our current state. That is what the natural world is going to give us. Does such a view provide humanity with meaning? Does life have meaning when we consider it this way? Over the past few years, both my grandparents and my mom's side passed away. They were in their 90s. My mom passed away. As we sort of wrapped up these lives that ended, um, Kelly and I spent a lot of time looking at uh, photo albums that were hidden in every little corner of the basement in the attic. And we're just flipping through. And you know what? There were so many people that I had no idea who they were. I didn't know their names. I didn't know where they were from. I don't know what relation they had to me, if any. And I doubt that there's many people left in my family alive right now that, probably, that, that know them either. All right, that's kind of sobering. If death is the end, then given enough passing of time and no one remembers us, how did our lives have any real meaning? Okay, there's temporary meaning. You, you, you may apply meaning to yourself, but I mean, if you just become an erased point of history, you know, I mean, where's the meaning in there? It may take time for that process to happen. Consider Homer. Who knows what Homer did? He wrote the Iliad. Wrote the Iliad, okay? <laughs> he wrote the Iliad, but guess what? That's all we know about Homer. I don't even know if he actually did write it. That's just what somebody said he did. Who was he? What did he look like? Who were his friends? What did he believe in life? I mean, he just wrote a story. Okay, how can we say that Homer's life really had any meaning if we don't even know anything about him other than he is a name? That's it. That's all we've got. He's just a name with an epic poem attached to it. Now, we may find some meaning in a certain circumstances, okay? Doctors working on a cure for cancer, great breakthroughs in technology that advance our civilization, amazing works of art or poetry that stir the soul. We might point out that each one of those things, as well as many other examples, that they're full of meaning. But again, if there's nothing beyond physical death, what lasting significance is to be found in curing cancer and the advances of technology and the creation of art. Because those things may provide temporary help or enjoyment, but in the end, they don't really matter. Why do I say that? Because, you know, science has proven that all of the universe is slowly drawing apart from itself. Thing, it's spreading out. <clears throat> Okay, and so at some point it's going to spread so far out that for this world we'll be too far from the sun and it'll just be a cold, lifeless husk of a world and it will not be capable of sustaining life. This is millions of years from now, but the point remains if the end is just death, if the credits just roll and there's no life to be found anywhere, what's the meaning behind all of this? So all the great achievements of man are, are ultimately worthless. That's a, that's a grim thought, friends. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, an atheist who grasped the meaningless of life, ended his play, No Exit, which portrayed life as hell, three people trapped together to torture one another through, uh, throughout eternity. He ended it as they all kind of just recognized the pointlessness of it all. Well, let's get on with it. That's just, just what we're going to do, so we might as well just do it, even though it has no meaning, even though it's not taking us anywhere good, and it's sort of pointless, let's get on with it. I believe that we see that line in evidence in the overall attitude of our nation as it shifts towards atheism. Let's get on with it. You watch how people are behaving today. There's a cloud of despair that seems to be hung over our society in general. There really does. The people are unhappy. That's why they're arguing and fighting about everything. When you're happy, do you pick fights with everybody? No, they're unhappy. Well, let's get on with it. That's the attitude. There seems to be little willingness on our society's part to persevere and rise above the difficulties and challenges of life. Just a lot of shouting 
and fighting. Why should they want to do anything any different if existence is objectively pointless? All right, on atheism, we can devise temporary placeholders to provide some meaning, but they don't last. How can they when we are the ones that devise them and we ourselves are temporary on this earth? Okay, for atheism, this is it. Your body, this is all you have. And when it's done, it's done. Atheism cannot provide an adequate foundation for objective meaning, meaning for life that is rooted in something transcendent, outside of and above human existence. Atheism can't do that. This is it. And it's all going to end if the natural world is all there is. Okay? Take a big breath. The stuff is... Okay, so you with me on that point? Everybody good? Wiggle your eyebrows, remember? Okay, objective value. Perhaps atheism has some means of demonstrating that human life has some intrinsic value to it. The Constitution speaks of that. Consider this. If we're simply random byproducts of evolution, do we have any claim to special human value? If we just... From the perspective of naturalism, right, that the natural world is all there is, by pure luck, we're the dominant species. Great whites might argue with us, but I'm going to go with humans. If we could rewind the clock and, start, and just do this random process all over again, next time around it could be the platypus that becomes the dominant species. See, if we claim to have more value than other creatures, where does that claim originate? Guess what? Because evolution doesn't care about the things that we care about. Might makes right, survival of the species, that's all evolution is about. See, if the claim of special value, humans are more important, humans have more value than the platypus, that's a subjective statement. Why? Because it's just coming from us, it's our opinion. We just think highly of ourselves. That's called speciesism. We just prefer our species above everything else. Okay, without a creator, though, to assign value to us, the value we think, it's simply an illusion. Okay, we're just all puffed up. If our only claim to fame is that we're a more advanced species, and if our lot in life is only to live and reproduce and die, then what reason do we have to approach living from any perspective other than absolute self-interest? I've had this argument before with some people. Kindness, compassion, generosity, within the atheist reality, those behaviors are absolute folly. The natural world is all there is. You're number one. Do everything you can to take care of yourself. Everything should be rooted in that simple statement. Mm -hmm. See, if humans have no value, then those taking up the banner of human rights issues, which social justice is so big right now. So many of them are atheists, okay? By and large, liberals, progressives tend to not be God-fearing Christians. I'm sure there are some there, and that's a conversation for another day. But these, these largely atheist, non-Christian at least people, these arguments for all the social justice that they're putting forth, they're being ridiculous. Why are they looking out for anybody else? They're wasting time when they should be looking out for number one. Mm -hmm. See, on atheism, those arguments, they're non-issues. If humans have no special value, if they have no, then intrinsic human rights don't exist. These things that they're saying you should have, they aren't real. Okay? We can argue about convenience. We, we, do, we, we give people these rights. We say they have them. So it's convenient. There's preference and the like, but they're not intrinsic. They're not just baked into humanity. Okay? And a natural view, and a materialist view, that kind of thinking that anyone has any intrinsic rights, it's nonsense. Okay? And, if, and, and here further, if atheism is true and human life has no special value, guess what? There's no basis for objective good or evil, okay? Good or evil outside of our opinion that exists despite that there's, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist on atheism. Within atheism, those concepts have come to exist 
because it benefits humanity to behave in ways that prevent society from breaking down. But is that what we mean when we talk about morality? No. Okay? If those moral concepts on atheism, if those ideas of good or evil, if they don't serve our self-interest, the only reason to adhere to them then is fear of punishment for breaking the social compact. You just don't want to get in trouble. I remember some rock star in the 80s in the era of the MTV's heyday got arrested, uh, Sam Kinison, uh, you know, and I can't listen to Sam Kinison anymore, so I have to be very careful bringing something like this to the pulpit, but he made a joke about a rock star that got in a, a DUI, he got arrested, he was drunk driving, and he's on MTV with a commercial about why not to drink and drive, and Sam Kinison is kind of mocking this guy's voice and saying, you know why I'm making this commercial, you know, what's the real lesson, don't get caught. You know, that's, that's morality under atheism. It's not that I did a bad thing or a good thing. I got caught, and that kind of stinks for me. Okay, that's not, that, that's all atheism has. Okay, so this leaves the atheist standing on little more than this treadmill, creating one little purpose after another. And as one apologist wrote, each time a purpose is achieved, they come up with something, and new purposes must be created quickly. Otherwise, happy, the hopelessness will set in again. And life becomes painful all over again. They just have to keep generating all of this meaning and value for themselves. This series of, of endless little purposes simply serves as a way to distract one from the reality that there is no overall life-fulfilling goal to reach other than just to make it in the end and not have had a miserable time of it. See, if God does not exist, that means that man and the universe exist to no purpose since the end and everything is death and that they came to be for no purpose since they're only blind products of chance. I mean, I know I just said that fast, but in short, life is utterly without reason on atheism. With no meaning and no value present for humanity, there can be no purpose for our species. Okay, so atheism lacks any means of providing purpose for human life. And most of the time, they're not very honest about that. But have you ever heard of Richard Dawkins? He's kind of very, he's famous. And I don't know why, because he's not even a very good atheist. Um, he wrote this. He's, he's one of the few honest atheists, I think, out there. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Ouch. See, we're teaching truths about the atheism view here, but most atheists do not stop to consider these things. Why wouldn't they? It's horrible. Okay, last point here for atheism. Oh, no, did we, we just did purpose. Oh, no, did we do purpose? We did purpose. I got a little lost there. I'm sorry. It's been a week, friends. <laughs> So this is the reality of atheism. And the truth is, no one can live in a way that honestly upholds it. No one does. Okay, so you know what atheists do? I'm going to teach you a little trick. Atheists construct a picture of a house, and it's got two floors. Floor one is the natural world, and floor two is the supernatural world. The atheist only believes... They say they only believe in the first floor, but if you listen to them talk about various things, social rights, good and bad, you know, how they, they care for many of the same things we do, but without reason. What they're doing is they're living on this first floor, they're denying the second floor, but every time they need something to support their unsupportable view, they have to borrow from us, they go like this. You know, they jump up and they grab something from the second floor. They borrow from us, but they deny that, that, that it's there. It's, it's such a... It's, it's sad is what it is. Okay, we should hurt for this. Okay, the writer of Ecclesiastes summed up the atheist view well when he wrote, meaningless, meaningless, said the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Atheism just simply lacks the means. This worldview is not able to give objective answers to our big three life questions. Okay? So, I've said that there's really only two worldviews worth considering. Atheism, which I think has the best case other than Christianity, and it's not a good case, and Christianity. So let's look at our side. That's why we read Acts 17 this morning, if you listen to Cynthia once you read from Scripture. Paul's doing apologetics. 
What do you say to the people in Athens? He said, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. He's talking apologetics right there. He checked out their culture. He got to understand their view a little bit. And now he's ready to give his side. So objective meaning, we're just going to run through the same thing now really quick with Christianity. Within the Christian view, does human life have meaning? Absolutely. You don't have to look far for this because God extends through Jesus Christ the offer of eternal life to humanity. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, Paul writes, For this perishable body was put on the imperishable, and this mortal body was put on immortality. The Bible teaches that death is not the end. I was just talking with Lee about this before we got started. I'm not, we don't, I'm not afraid of death. It's not the end. I may be afraid of how I go about the process of dying. But the actual end, it's not the end. It's actually the beginning of the real good stuff. I can't wait. Jump in the arms of Jesus. I'm going to be like a little kid when I meet my Savior. Whew. Live and in person, physical. Right? The Bible teaches that death's not the end, that life continues beyond the grave, and immortality awaits those who place their trust in Jesus. That changes everything. That's a game changer. That has tremendous implications for each of us who are in Christ. See, now there's no struggle to find meaning. Quite the contrary, objective meaning, objective truth despite your opinion, it's, it's practically obvious. You and I were created for eternity. And this is more than eternity spent in the company of other Christians. This is eternal life spent in fellowship with our creator. And speaking of the glory that awaits when temporal history comes to a close, Revolution, Revelation 21 says God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the future that God longs for, to be joyfully reunited with all of us for eternity. These truths found in scripture provide objective meaning to our existence because the meaning is provided by God. That he created us, he loves us, he redeems us, and he longs to be in fellowship with us solely because of his nature and his character. It's because of who he is. So all of our ups and downs, our struggles, our pains, our suffering, our tragedies, they no longer happen within the scope of a life that simply ends with a meaningless death. That's not true on Christianity. Rather, all that we experience during the course of our mortal lives takes place within the context of the glorious hope of eternal life spent in the presence of God. So start to, right, start to pick up a little bit all that atheism stuff that brings you down a little bit. This gets you back up. Through the ages, we can see in many writings that man has always sought meaning beyond his physical existence. And this is because God has put eternity into man's heart, the word says. Christianity answers that need for eternity and gives human life meaning. I've always argued, those who are not for Christianity, atheists themselves, they say, religion is just silly. Why does anybody think that in the first place? Well, I'm like, that's kind of a good question. Where did the thought of anything divine even come from? Why go there? Why not just look at the world around you and just imagine that the world was doing things? Where did this idea that there's a reason for the thunder and the lightning and the rain and, and, and where did that come from? God put it there. The fact that man ever sought to ask that question is some evidence in and of itself, friends. So can we? So I, I'm going to argue that Christianity answers that need for eternity and that gives human life meaning. Now, can we find objective value within the Christian faith? We've often said, have you ever heard us said, we're more than animals? We're more than animals. Implying that humans have special value. That's what we're saying when we make that statement. Does our faith provide a reason to believe that? Yes, it does. Within the Christian faith, the value of human life is intrinsic. For it derives from God, who made human beings in his own image. Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then the Bible tells us that God considered us very good after he had made us. 
Now we're sadly familiar with the fall of man, and we know that creation is currently in a corrupted state, but the fall doesn't overwrite the original value assigned to us by God. And it also doesn't change the fact that the Father sent Jesus to redeem his creation. Romans chapter 3, 24, we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. With these verses in mind and the truth of the Bible out there in front of us, our value is unquestionable. God would not let the fall go unanswered. We're worth redeeming. And this isn't some distant God going through the notions like theists believe. This is a personal creator. His very nature is all loving. 1 John 4, 16, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. The value of humanity, friends, it leaps off the pages of Scripture. So we are humans made in our Creator's image, redeemed by our Savior, infinitely loved by God. So now rather than self-interest being our sole motivator, Christians are motivated by what? By love and gratitude, right? Due to our measurable value, due to everything that our Creator does for us on our behalf. We have every good reason to follow the example set forth by our Master Jesus. Rather than look out for number one, we instead love the Lord with all our heart, mind, strength, and spirit, and we love our neighbors as ourselves, and even love our enemies. Understand that this type of love, right, agape love that God calls us to is not possible if we don't have value. There's simply no way to love others without some sort of self-interest. If you do not know that you have God-given value, that you are loved by God, that redemption and reconciliation with God is freely available through Christ. As we're made in the image of God, we also have within us some of the characteristics of our Creator, right? We have an inherent understanding of morality. Romans 2.15, humanity shows that the work of the law is written on their hearts. God made us so that you all have an innate understanding of the moral law, the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. It is his nature, God's nature, that determines what is good and evil. That's such an important point. Don't miss that. God's nature determines what is good and, good and evil, what is right and wrong. And we know that God is all good. Psalm 92, 15, there's no evil within him. And his view on evil is clear in Romans 12, 9. We are instructed to abhor what is evil. And some knowledge of these truths has been placed in our hearts by our maker. They're part of our makeup. It's part of what it means to be human, to know these things. Apologist Nancy Piercy wrote when speaking of human value, she said, I'm creative. If you haven't read Nancy Piercy, you're missing out. She's one to look for. A total truth, finding truth, she's brilliant, and she's got such a gentle tone. She said, I'm created in the image of God, and God has called me into existence and continues to know and love me. Human beings do not need to earn the right to be treated as creatures of great value. Our dignity is intrinsic, rooted in the fact that God made us, knows us, and loves us. I believe that we can confidently affirm that within the context of the Christian faith, Humanity has an overwhelming objective value. Stretch or something. <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm, I'm a little worn out to say all this stuff. I begin, see, we're, we're talking about the meaning of life today. Okay, because these are questions that everybody, if they don't ask them, they wonder them. At night when you're laying in bed or when you're out there doing something and walking through the woods, we, we just, these questions bubble up out of us. We've got to talk about them. So objective purpose, right? Purpose is perhaps one of the deepest human longings. How does Christianity respond to that longing? The Bible affirms human purpose in two ways. First, there's a general purposefulness about human life. Isaiah 43, 7, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that God created man for a specific purpose, for his glory. Isaiah writes, everyone who is called by my name, 
whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Okay, we are made for the glory of God. So the ultimate purpose of man, above everything else, from a gas station attendant to a college to a professor, all points in between, is simply to glorify God. That is a human's purpose. And then a few verses in later 10, God adds, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. Not only are we to glorify God, we're to speak of his glory to others. Right? What did Jesus say? We've been preaching this now for a few months. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. The Lord's instructions here include being with him, obeying him, and witnessing to others. Okay, John 15, Jesus speaks to his disciples at the Last Supper. What he said, he said, I chose you and appointed you so that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Look at the purpose in that statement. We've been chosen to bear fruit, to have a relationship with the Father, and to have a relationship with others. Now, individually, God has purposes for our own lives. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. There's universal good works God prepared for us, such as obedience to Christ witnessing, simply enjoying God. That's something we're to do. But there's also individual works. The Bible's loaded with examples of God's personal touch on people's lives. Psalm 139 is a beautiful depiction of the care which God created us. He knitted us together in our mother's womb. We're unique creations, friends. We will all have opportunities to glorify God uniquely. Did you ever stop to think about that? We don't all just do it the same. So rather than chasing endless little purposes that lead to no ultimate goal, as Christians, each one of us is empowered through the Holy Spirit to pursue godly purposes that satisfy the ultimate goal of glorifying the one who made us. Rabbi Zacharias said this, God's made you for a purpose. All the tiny little purposes become purposeful because your life itself has purpose. <laughs> I'll say that. And I, you know, I miss Robbie. I don't know the man personally. He's with the Lord now, but uh, I can hear his voice as he's, you know, as I say that sentence, and I'm not going to try to do it. Uh, God's made you for a purpose. All the tiny little purposes become purposeful because your life itself has purpose. <laughs> How cool is that? The Christian faith, God answers the longing humans have for objective purpose, purpose that is outside of our opinion, true no matter what anybody thinks about it. Meaning, value, purpose, when atheism is left grasping at empty air trying to respond to these questions, Christianity provides answers to all three of those big life questions. Our faith, it provides context for our lives. And it does so in a way that matches human experience. That's so important. <clears throat> it's not like God has put something in place that is completely alien to us and we have to do an about face on everything that we know and, and understand and do in order to connect with him. No. God created us in his image. The things that he has for us, the things that he wants, it matches human experience. It makes sense. So let's conclude. And I mean that. I've only got a couple more sentences. Not one of those three page. Let's conclude. It's been a bit of a journey this morning. It was a long message. Okay, but not only do we find the answers we seek when we turn to the Christian faith, God takes things a step further. Okay, because rather than just answer our deepest questions in abstract ways, in Colossians 1, 16 to 17, speaking of the Lord Jesus, Paul writes, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions 
or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This Jesus, and whom and for whom all things were made, who holds everything together, the author and finisher of salvation, the Son of God, saw fit to be born as a human, to die on a cross for the sins of humanity, and to be raised from the dead three days later, and that paved the way to eternity for all who believe in him. This Jesus alone satisfies the answers of meaning, value, or purpose for our human lives. He is the meaning, the value, and the purpose for our human lives. Let's pray. Father, just taking a moment to sort of collect ourselves so we really uh, just dove deep into, into some apologetic waters uh, this morning, Lord. We dove into the waters of Scripture. We considered those who do not know you, who maybe they're seeking you and they don't know you yet. And many times they just simply oppose you or want nothing to do with you. But Lord, either way, they're separated uh, from, from the grace that you have for them. And Lord, we want that to change. We want them to know Christ. We want that. We want that garden party of eternity to just be so filled with so many. We want to have a big celebration. Father, to that end, we don't say a statement like that flippantly or just say it and then walk away from it. We want to train. We want to get equipped. We want to be ready. We want to be prepared to give that defense for the hope that we have. We want to be able to answer questions when they're brought forward to us. And Lord, so today we, we studied just what, what's at stake. How thin this foundation that the atheist view that, that it has, Lord, but, but that, that so often those who hold to that view, they're not asking these questions honestly. They're, they're stuck in an echo chamber. They're, they're, they're resisting the truth for whatever their reasons. Lord, help us to have a better understanding of what they believe so that we can understand it and respond and answer questions and point them to you in some kind of fashion that there's there's commonality in the conversation, that they're willing to hear us, that we're reasonable uh, in how we speak to them and the things that we say in our attitudes. Lord, we just want them to know Jesus. Lord, thank you that we know Jesus. Lord, we pray that we're, we're going to be a faithful church and that we're going to look for the mission you have for us. We already know the top level one, make disciples. What do we do here in Chapag Valley? Lord, help us just to better understand that, to see clearly what you have for us. We want to be active and doing the good work of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I share the song that I've chosen for this morning, I'd like to share how it came about. Um, it's interesting that Troy mentioned this toward the end of his message. Um, I'm a person who lays in bed at night. I do have sleep issues. I don't always sleep well. I don't go to sleep. I'm a thinker. I'm a wanderer. I'm a questioner. And it keeps me awake. And this one particular night, about two months ago, I woke in the middle of the night and inside my head, this song was singing to me. It was, the, the, it was a strange thing that doesn't normally happen for me. And of course I remembered it, I grew up with this song, and I started trying to sing it. And as I'm singing it in the middle of the night, I then went to sleep, and when I woke up in the morning, I had to look this song up, I had to know the words. And I believe that the Lord gave this song to me because of my thinking, wondering, questioning. And this is what he wanted. He wanted this song to be my prayer. And what I'm asking today is that as you listen to the words of this song, that it might become your prayer also. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. 
Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise, let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee, filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. about the message uh, feel free to call me email me uh, don't be a stranger and uh, we're gonna we'll continue to do a little bit more of apologetics in the coming weeks uh, but uh, let's have a, a bow our heads in a blessing moment and let's get sent out into the week that the lord has for us and lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and all god's children said amen, amen. peace